boiling in Bologna. It's really very, very hot. So you will appreciate uh... Okay. I repeat, good uh, afternoon. It's really boiling in Bologna, very hot. So you will appreciate uh, that uh, we are going to take you to the sea. <laughs> but the sea uh, is not uh, an idyllic place, as uh, we know. <laughs> the aim uh, of uh, today's public event of uh, the public uh, of the summer school is precisely to focus uh, on the sea. The sea is, of course, historically very important uh, for uh, the organization of uh, political spaces uh, in uh, modernity. The sea has been uh, traversed by colonists, by pirates, by seamen, by slaves. It has been the set of the building of empire and of the constitution of global capitalism, but it has also been a site of radical uh, political uh, experiments. Today the sea is uh, a scene of uh, some of the most uh, intense uh, conflicts uh, of uh, our age. At sea, these conflicts uh, take uh, a particularly harsh uh, shape. If you think of uh, global change, of uh, resource extraction, uh, of geopolitical tensions, uh, of logistics, uh, of migration, uh, all these processes uh, are uh, Deployed at sea in a very specific uh, way. So, to explore these uh, seascapes uh, of uh, conflict, we have uh, invited uh, Lale Khalidi from Queen Mary University of London. Lale is uh, the author of uh, several books, uh, including the acclaimed uh, Sea News uh, of War and Trade that uh, came out from uh, Verso last uh, year. And it is really an amazing uh, book on uh, shipping and global capitalism uh, focused on China's maritime uh, Silk Road uh, and uh, centered upon uh, the Arabic uh, Peninsula. As discussants, we invited uh, Lorenzo Pezzani and uh, Charles Eller. Lorenzo and Charles uh, uh, got their uh, PhD at uh, Goldsmiths in London at the Center for uh, Research Architecture and they have been uh, working together for several years now on uh, conflicts surrounding migration uh, borders uh, in uh, the Mediterranean. Some years ago, they launched uh, an exciting project uh, entitled uh, Forensic uh, Oceanography, and I think uh, they will have to say something uh, about uh, the project. Lale's uh, talk is entitled Unions and Missions, 
modalities of maritime mobilization. Dale, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting our, for, for accepting our invitation. Uh, Sandro, thank you very much for uh, your generous introduction. I'm incredibly excited to be able to speak um, to uh, your summer school and very much honored. Um, uh, and part of, uh, I think I'd like to preface the talk with a couple of points. First, um, the, the, the title of your summer school is what happens after COVID. Um, and in fact, my uh, the, the larger question that shapes the talk that I'm going to be giving is also about the modalities of um, dealing with uh, seafarer abandonment, which is something that has become very clear during the period of COVID. Uh, seafarers have been left at sea and who serves abandoned seafarers? So that's the first question. The second thing is that, um, and I have to uh, apologize for this, um, my original um, abstract, uh, and this is all brand new research, what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, it's not in the book, none of it is. And it's all based on an archive that nobody else has used. So it's really brand new research. Originally, I was going to talk about unions and missions, and you'll see this. But um, the more that I worked on the missions, the more interesting questions came up. And and I, in some ways, ended up not dropping the unions out a little bit. But I hope to be able to discuss that with both Lorenzo and um, Charles. So um, please feel free to ask questions about that. Um, a final point before I start. Um, last night, um, the great literary scholar Lauren Berlant um, died from complications uh, of cancer. Uh, and so this afternoon I was reading some of their essays um, and kind of st stuff that had shaped the way I had thought about things. And I ran into um, a couple of quotes that I'm going to read because I think they set the scene for the broader project that this um, article about missions is part of. The first one is from an article they had written called Post Fordist Affect. And the question is, uh, the question that they ask is, what happens when the economic and social promise of a state becomes privatized like everything else, redistributed through emerging non-state institutions and formal and informal economies. And I just, um, I ran into that question and I, I post for this Africa had always been one of my favorite articles that they had written. And, and this sentence jumped, this question jumped out at me. And I think that that was quite relevant to what I wanted to talk about today. But they also had a lecture that they gave in 2015 and to a geography um, uh, 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 conference uh, and it was an essay the, the essay that they that came out of that lecture was about infrastructure and this quote is also from their essay on infrastructure and they say the present is a scene shaped by the infrastructural breakdown of modernist practices of resource distribution social relation and affective continuity and that includes within communities of solidarity from the nation state to the grassroots given newly intensified tensions anxieties and antipathies at all levels of intimate abstraction the question of politics becomes identical with the reinvention of infrastructures for managing the unevenness ambivalence violence and ordinary contingency of contemporary existence and so the my concern at this moment is with the creation of those infrastructures that would allow us to have a new form of politics so in memory of lauren berlant and in the extraordinary way in which their writing inspired um, i'm going to now start my paper um, in early 1985, um, as the tanker wars between Iran and Iraq reached um, its first of several crescendos, Reverend Ernie Arnold of the Mission to Seamen in Dubai recounted a horrifying incident in his monthly report to the organization's headquarters in London. He said, a badly damaged firefighting support vessel had, uh, was believed to have been hit by Iranian missiles and it was towed into the Dubai dry docks. Uh, the Dubai dry docks is where, you know, ships are repaired. Now the ship was, and here I'm quoting from these documents, the ship was a mass of twisted and burnt wreckage. The survivors and the two dead seamen had been taken off in Bahrain and the captain was missing, presumed blown into the water. 
Last Tuesday, nine days after the boat came to the dock in Dubai, I, meaning Reverend Arnold, received a telephone call from the local manager of Swires International. Swires International, for those who don't know, is a um, very old, it's about 100 or so years old shipping agency that was originally based out of Beirut, but uh, sorry, out of Liverpool, but which, are, which has now um, all sorts of connections elsewhere um, in the world. Um, Okay, so I received a telephone call from the local manager of Squires International who wanted to see me urgently. He then told me that someone had discovered some signs of human remains in the shattered wheelhouse. The wheelhouse is where the captain uh, drives the ship and that the captain was somewhere there. In the local situation, there could be no help from either the police or hospitals to help in the recovery. So it fell upon the local manager to do the job. It ended up with him, a doctor and myself spending about three and a half hours on Thursday gathering, gathering together what we were able to find by sorting through the ashes and other remains in the wheelhouse. That evening, just before the light failed, we took about three quarters of a bin liner out to the Indian burning place. I guess that's a crematorium and placed it upon a funeral pyre and read the committal service. I felt that God was really with me during this harrowing episode, as by nature, I'm one of, a, one of the squeamish kind, so I can't go fishing as I don't want to take them off the hook. Yet after an almost sleepless night, as I thought about it, I found that when it came to the crunch, I was able to put my feelings into limbo and get on with the job. I suppose that this is what's called the strength of the Holy Spirit, um, end quote. Um, this quote was really strong striking when I read it. It was kind of harrowing. During the tanker wars, Iran and Iraq targeted ships lifting oil um, or serving ports perceived to belong to the Allied or, uh, or to be allied with the enemy. So over 400 ships were hit, about 60% of them uh, by um, the, the Iraqis, and a very large number of seafarers died, although most people did, don't actually remember that. They just remember the ships being hit, which is also quite interesting. The harrowing reports from the mission to seafarers in Bahrain and Dubai recording these attacks have a baroque quality. Month after month, the monthly reports brim with seafarers' intense fear of sailing into the Gulf on their tankers, supply vessels, and cargo ships. And the clergymen and laymen working at the mission to seafarers in Bahrain and Dubai are there to provide succor and to do tasks that no one else is willing or permitted to do, like um, Reverend Arnold going and collecting the remains of somebody that had been um, burnt to death out of the wheelhouse to be buried. So what is the role of the mission to seafarers today? In what ways has the transmutation of missionary movements into humanitarian organizations been affected by the end of empire, but also by, by the end of the British empire, obviously the empire hasn't ended, and also by the dominance of unfettered global capital embodied in both transnational and regional firms and corporations? What does faith-based humanitarian work do when its object of ministry Sorry, um, I was been asked to slow down. Uh, what does faith-based humanitarian work do when its object of ministry are not those ordinarily portrayed as the abject in need of care, like the displaced or the refugees, the starving, the impoverished, the outcast, lepers essentially, but workers, people whose plights and dilemmas are as much a product of capitalism as they are of geopolitics. Now, in this essay, I argue that the mission to seafarers, like many other missions whose or origins could be traced to imperial Europe and North America, began as a tutelary organization, as a kind of a paternalistic organization, whose institutions depended on the grace and favor of imperial governments and metropolitan corporations, companies, in both cordial and contested ways. Their work overseas was from the very start intertwined with imperial networks and metropolitan commercial concerns, and on the Arabian Peninsula, it was designed to accommodate British naval and civilian seafarers on shore, but was resisted, interestingly, by the colonial government there, and I'll talk about this a little bit more. After decolonization, open registries, 
um, flags of convenience, um, which were already existing in the 20th century, became predominant. Flags of convenience, for those who may not know, are flags that a ship flies. A ship obeys the laws of the flag that it flies. And flags of convenience are flags of countries like Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands, and other uh, countries like that, who have open registries. And these open registries allow for payment of lower wages to seafarers, but they also um, allow tax avoidance, allow uh, lower thresholds for insurance um, and essentially have very lax kind of adherence to things like um, uh, environmental or labor regulations. So flags of convenience or open registries are something that the International Transport Workers Federation, for example, resists very strongly. So after decolonization, open registries, which had already existed in the early 20th century, end up becoming very predominant. And dual wage regimes abroad, sh uh, aboard ships end up emerging in a really big way, uh, essentially a form of um, neoliberalization of labor aboard ships. And the number of British seafarers after decolonization declines dramatically. In this period, and what I mean by this is the 1970s and 80s, the mission to seafarers have become much broader in their remit, serving a more global body of seafarers, most from the global south. And this has continued very extensively, where now, of course, the vast majority of seafarers are from the global south. They are, um, and I'll talk about this again a little bit further down. Now, in this period, the mission have also become more NGOized, they've become more like NGOs, providing welfare services, particularly to abandoned seafarers, which, while urgently necessary, also depoliticizes the very political and economic context which have produced the conditions of their abandonment. As I will try to show below, this focus on a category of workers vexes troubles the humanitarian impulse of these missions, while bringing into question the effectiveness of such service when it subjectivizes the seafarers it serves as individuals rather than as collectives constituted in struggle. Collectives constituted in struggle of, are, of course, unions, for example, right? F different forms of mobilization that require different um, uh, institutions, and the missions tend to subjectivize people as individuals. Now, the research for this project draws on catalogs that I stumbled into of the mission to seafarers in the Hull History Center. These catalogs um, have not yet been, uh, uh, these um, archives have not yet been cataloged even. And so I'm one of the first people to actually go through the catalogs that have to do with the Arabian Peninsula. And they're an amazingly rich body of work. Additionally, much of my view and the larger framing of this project has been formed by ethnography aboard container ships and at ports, interviews with a number of mission to seafarers and other missions representatives in the Middle East, as well as interviews with seafarers and maritime union representatives in a number of seafaring countries, as well as online. I'm on, I'm on a number of different seafarer lists where you know there are people discussing this and those are really excellent ways that you can talk to people. Facebook is, is a wonderful resource for talking to seafarers. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about well, what mission to seafarers is. The original um, sort of center kernel of the mission to seamen, um, the Bristol Channel Mission, was founded in the port of Bristol in 1836 by an Anglican minister called John Ashley as part of a larger Anglican revival. So there was a major religious revival that started at the end of the, uh, started in the 18th century and actually attached itself to abolitionist movements, um, slavery abolitionist movements. Um, and this, um, and, and this, Anglican revival also extended to the creation of this mission to seamen. Um, this original organization then joined with some others to form the mission to seamen in 1856. And its intent was to minister to the British colony, uh, British sailors who were traveling to, um, to the colonies essentially, because Bristol was one of the main ports out of which seafarers went to the colonies. Um, it is no surprise that as the empire expanded and consolidated in the latter half of the 19th century, this is again the British Empire, missions ministering to these muscles of empire, muscles of empire is a term that Frank Brose has used to refer to these seafarers, these muscles of empire would also grow exponentially. 
In its early years, the mission to seamen began with sailors' homes in Bristol and London, later expanding to other major British ports, uh, both in Britain, but also in the empire. So, for example, in Liverpool, but also one of the earliest of these sailors' homes was set up in Aden, because Port of Aden in Yemen was such a significant and important um, port in the empire. By the start of the First World War, the mission to seamen's churches and institutes, institutes being clubs, surpassed 150, with many of them spread throughout the empire. In many ways, the mission to seafarers was unique. Workplace chaplains had served everyone in armies, workhouses, prisons, and hospitals as part of their parochial work, as part of the work that they did in their parish. At sea, the earliest incarnations of mission to seamen resembled the industrial missions that ministered to workers in urban and industrial areas. So, for example, in Britain, there were these things called industrial missions, which appeared in cities um, like Sheffield or in Glasgow, so major working class cities that tried to sort of do missionary work, um, sort of supporting uh, workers in those places. Um, so th th there was a similarity between them and also a little bit of similarity. It wasn't quite as radical as, for example, the French uh, worker priests who, um, who were much more radical in their in their orientation, but it was essentially a recognition that they, they, a recognition by religious authorities that they wanted to work with um, uh, workers. But in some ways, a mission to seamen was very different than these industrial missions because it did a lot of overseas work. And it also appealed not to a static and stable community of workers, but a transient, highly mobile, and even from very early on, very international group of laborers. Like the industrial missions, the pivotal moment in the transformation of the form and function of the mission to seafarers was the 1970s and the period of decolonization and neoliberalization, because of course these two things um, overlap. In the Arabian Peninsula, the mission to seafarers presence tracked the strategic significance of the ports to the British Empire. So in the Arabian Peninsula, along the littoral of Saudi Arabia's vast expanse in the center of the peninsula, the British had, from uh, the 19th century onwards, two different kinds of colonial arrangements. The first was a direct colony, and that was Aden, which was decolonized in 1838. And it was at some point the fourth most important coal fueling port in the world after London, New York and Liverpool. I mean, it's, it was an enormously important place and its importance increased when the Suez Canal opened. The second arrangement was that of protection. So these were British protectorates in the Gulf, including um, Oman, Kuwait, and the various emirates, including Qatar. Uh, and uh, in Oman and, and Bahrain and in southern Yemeni hinterlands, these had been important strategic nodes in the empire and facilitated connection between London and India. And then, of course, oil was discovered in the 1930s in some of these um, protectorates from 1930s onwards, which made their importance um, economic as well as strategic, uh, although so of course, those two things are difficult to separate from one another. Now, why is this significant? The literature on the entanglement between Christian missions and imperial networks, ideologies, and anxieties is huge. There are literally tens of thousands of books and articles written about Christian missionaries. There's a fascinating interest in the way that they brought a particular kind of civilizing mission and culture with them. And they often came with empire. The debates are largely, the debates in the literature are largely about the extent to which the missions did the work of empire, as opposed to more ambivalent and contradictory impulses. For example, in a 1966 book that ultimately vindicated the British missionary practice, that was essentially an apologia for British missionary practice, an Anglican bishop who had himself been a former missionary to India, he accepted that, and I quote him, whatever may have been the beneficent intentions of missionaries, they were in fact the tools of government and instruments of Western infiltration and control. So he actually admitted this. He was himself a missionary. In some places, the Christianity the missions brought was adopted and indigenized. South Africa is one example. In others, it was wholeheartedly resisted. 
In most places, beyond the questions of conversion and subjectivization, missions established welfare institutions that invited the indigenous populations to connect with the church. Education and healthcare were seen as modernizing practices that helped provide a crucial legitimizing ideology of development to the colonial state. And in, in, return, by, in return for pro providing this kind of an ideological legitimation, it received much re uh, needed subsidies for the mission work. In, this, in the classics of the genre, uh, John and Jean Komarov have argued, however, that missionary work in the colonies presented, and I quote, complex dialectic of challenge and repost, domination and defiance. So it was never one thing or another. It was quite intense. The position of the missionaries was often complex and they often occupied an ambivalent location within their own societies as well as in foreign lands. I'm often reminded of um, Archbishop um, Tutu of uh, South Africa, who's a great hero, um, anti-apartheid hero, um, saying that um, the missionaries came to my land and they gave us the Bible and we gave them the land. And people often quote this, but the second part of his uh, quotation is, and we are better for it. So there is a particular way in which people have been subjectivized to accept that Christianity. And I think we have to take that seriously. We have to take that tension seriously, that it was indeed a colonial imposition, but which was taken and adopted in particular ways. Now, the mission to seamen in the Arabian Peninsula differed from many of the missions studied above, not only because it served a category of workers, but because it was anachronistic in terms of its timing. Right? All of these other missions arrive either ahead of empire or alongside it, whereas the mission to seafarers arrives in the Arabian Peninsula um, towards the end of the uh, British Empire there, towards the uh, period of time where these countries were becoming independent. But also, interestingly, it arrives at a moment in which there is a fundamental transformation in the meaning and work of missions in a decolonizing world. That a global shift in the civilizational discourse from salvific and Christianizing to humanitarian or even radically secularized was one of the most significant characteristics of most missionary work in this sort of a decolonization period in the period after the Second World War. This mission to seafarers also differed from other missions in that the local colonial government the British government in, for example, Bahrain or Kuwait or um, Aden were often quite unwilling to provide the necessary resources to the mission to seafarers. They didn't want the mission to seafarers there. In ports of the Arabian Peninsula, ministry to seafarers happened as part of the work of the chaplains of the Anglican communities there. Other countries and denominations, seafarers, ministries, for example, the Norwegians, also had unobtrusive presences in these places. Unobtrusive because their seafarer centers had secular names and practices. They weren't allowed to sort of declare their Christianity in open ways. In Saudi Arabia, where the government discouraged the presence of Christian institutions after the 1950s, such ministry was performed via Aramco and with no apparent connection to any church or country. The relationship between the mission to seafarers and British colonial governments in the Arabian Peninsula was never straightforward. While in Britain, the various seafarer societies associated with the church collaborated with the government's Merchant Navy Welfare Board, this body um, that supported the seafarers, and they, they worked really closely together. In Arabia, the mission actually pushed, received a lot of pushback from the British colonial advisors, bureaucrats, and government ministers there. So that was quite interesting to me. I, I was expecting like, the British to be like, oh, yeah, come on in. And the British government was absolutely did not want the missions there. Now, um, examples are rife, but I'll men only mention Bahrain here. The discussions about a mission to seafarers in Bahrain actually went back all the way to 1947. Um, and a mission was not established until 1982. So about 80, uh, sorry, about 35 years later. So going back all the way to 1947, they show the British government of Bahrain reluctant to allow a club for seafarers. And it uses a series of excuses that it tries to shift the blame on to the local population. So for example, in one instance, the Bahraini, the, the, Amer the British political uh, agent in Bahrain talks to the political resident, the big boss there, and says, 
if the men are allowed to roam, if the roaming sailors, if the sailors are allowed to roam at will all over the island, I should certainly not welcome an institute or a club, um, since it would be bound to bring with it complications involving public scrutiny. I know from experience in Bahrain that many of the seafarers in ships calling here are a rough type and difficult to handle. Their presence would bring in its wake problems of jails, police, importation of drinks, sexual immorality, such as were experienced when troops were stationed in the island. While all of this would be offensive to the sheikh, the solution of these unpleasant problems would devolve to his government and the agency courts, meaning to the British. And so they were really concerned about these seafarers coming. Interestingly, of course, they, as I said, they use moral excuses like, you know, sexual, using brothels and drinking. But in fact, in many of these places, there were also British rules in place that banned the arrival of anybody who was a communist or from a communist country. So there was also a lot of worries about seafarers bringing with them subversive ideas. Another excuse that was used um, in, in some of these places is also another interesting excuse. So one of the ways in which the British governments actually resisted these um, seafarers clubs was because they said, what we're going to do is there are two different kinds of ports in all of these places. This, there was an instance, for example, in Kuwait, where you had an oil terminal, which was an Ahmadi port, and then you had a cargo terminal, which was in Shweikh, and they were about 20 miles apart, right? The same was also true in Bahrain, where you had an oil terminal that was in Citra, and you had a cargo terminal, which was in another part of Bahrain, in this instance, five miles apart. What was interesting was that the oil terminals were managed by private companies. In this instance, in Bahrain's case, uh, in a subsidiary of Standard Oil of California. In Kuwait's case, a subsidiary of British Petroleum. At the time, it was Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. And so the British government the, in Kuwait and Bahrain was totally fine with having a seafarer club that was managed by the oil companies in the oil cargo, but it was not happy with setting up a, a um, with uh, setting up a club in the cargo ports, which were further away. So it was much more difficult. Now, my sense is that part of the reason that this existed also was because as we read in the archives, most of the dry cargo ships that would have gone to the cargo ports which, where the British did not want a club were actually the seafarers were Indian. Whereas most of the seafarers that ended up going to the clubs in oil terminals were Norwegian or British or uh, Dutch. And therefore, there was a color line operating here as well, so that a club was thought to be necessary for these European seafarers, but a club was not thought to be necessary for the Indian seafarers that were on the cargo ships. This was, it was very clear that this was one of the things that was in operation there. Now, um, the fact that successive British colonial regimes in the Arabian Peninsula resisted the establishment of missions in these protectorates and colony, uh, colonies is striking. One can speculate that in part this has to do with the aforementioned fear of rough seafarers coming ashore, but it also has to do with changes in the character of seafaring on the one hand and in the character of missionary work on the other. With decolonization, the prevalence of flags of convenience and the dual wage regimes, by, what, by which I mean officers, often from European countries, getting paid one set of wages and one, having one set of contracts, and the crew, often from the global south, having much lower wages and much longer contracts. So you have a dual wage regime aboard the ships. Because of all of these things, um, when we, when one sees a, uh, the proportion of European seafarers drops precipitously at precisely the moment that the British withdraw their forces. Up until that point, the British government would depend on the facilities provided by corporations and did not see a need for separate service for them. But at exactly in the same juncture as the British fleets reduced their domination of the seas in the 1970s, and in the absence of formal British governing organizations, troops, bases, what they do then is to depend on British corporations and civic and advisory organizations, including the mission, to step forward and bring the work of seafarers. So in a sense, this, the dependence on civil society, and in this instance also corporations, is intended to do what no longer a colonial regime could do. So you want to replace the colonial regime with these civil institutions. <laughs> 
The relationship of the mission with the local rulers who then come to power is much more troubled. We hear a lot less in the reports about the local governments or the rulers and a lot more about the functionaries. Uh, for example, the harbor masters, port managers, head of police and others, many of whom are actually British until the 1990s. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more. There is a double bind constraining the mission um, in this period. Um, on the one hand, they offer humanitarian work no one else will do, including the governments in these places, because of the circumscription of unions in the Gulf states, so that the, the unions can't be there to support them. Um, but, but they're also there at the grace and favor of the ruling family. So they're only there because, so they're in a sense dependent on these authoritarian regimes that have banned unions. They're dependent on their permission in order to do the work they're doing, which kind of binds their work in an interesting interesting way. In his, in his sweeping synopsis of the entanglement of missions and empires, Norman Etherington, a hist historian, has claimed that, and I quote, a map of worldwide missionary activity, even British missionary activity, does not resemble the map of forma formal empire in any era. I would disagree. I would say in the Arabian Peninsula, one might think that the reluctance of the colonial government to entertain the mission to seafarers, would, you would think that that would mean that it doesn't follow the empire. But in fact, if we thought of empire, not only as the structures of government, then the story of the mission to seafarers actually echoes the empire's commercial interests. In his classic article on the limits of the state, um, the great uh, Middle East studies of scholar Tim Mitchell argues that the institutional mechanisms of a modern political order are never confined within the limits of what is called the state. These institutions of power are not necessarily, and he says, a single totalized structure of power. They're not that. On the contrary, there are always conflicts between them, as there are between different government agencies, between corporate organizations, and within each of them. So he begins by talking about the blurry state boundaries of the state, but also about conflictual relationships within it. The contradictory, sometimes contested, sometimes collaborative relationship between missions and corporations has been a part of the forms of modern political order in the Arabian Peninsula. In Britain's empire in Indian Africa, the evangelical revival, especially in the 19th century, saw colonial commerce as part of God's plan for civilizing Asians and Africans. The civilizing impulse, not to mention financial need of the missions, was so intense that the missionaries even reconciled themselves to working with merchants involved in the opium trade. So on the one hand, they were saying that it's really bad to be addicted to opium, but on the other hand, they were working with these merchants precisely because those kinds of compromises were necessary for the work that they were doing. But the relationship was not always straightforward. While the revivalist Anglican missions were crucial in consolidating the empire and its commercial concerns, some also contested commerce, uh, some also contested colonial commerce. Extractive industries and their founders also stand out among corporations that work closely with missions and fund their work overseas. I've got in the longer article that this is uh, based on, I've got loads of examples, for example, of American robber barons involved in all sorts of mining and extraction um, that actually were very, very significant to funding missions overseas in countries where they wanted to go and do mining and extraction. One example, one very prominent example is John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil, who was famously pious and had funded churches and missions throughout his lifetime. The role he saw for these missions was for them to encourage the workers in his mines and factories to have, quote unquote, higher thoughts than labor agitation. And so, so Christianity was intended to be a kind of a pacification effort. One can name a number of other baron, robber barons who both laundered their reputation and cemented footholds overseas through their support of missions. Now, in the case of the mission to seafarers, if there has been a dramatic shift in the works that they have been doing from the period that they arrived in their peninsula from after the Second World War all the way to now, is in their relationship with firms and corporations, and especially the big beasts serving the empire's energy and transportation needs, these being British Petroleum, British Tanker Company, Gray Mackenzie, p &O, the famous shipping company, and the like. For the British government, the attenuation and control of itinerant and mobile populations in these Gulf Emirates and its colony of Aden was a constant concern. 
and the control of their movement and provision of services to them was often farmed out to corporations. So in the oil ports of Kuwait, Qatar and Abu Dhabi, oil company chaplains, priests, vicars that work with oil companies, provided services to seafarers, even if there were no clubs or institutes. In Bahrain, the former uh, British political agent, the one whose quote I read earlier, he goes on to become the chairman of Overseas Tank Ship Company in Britain. And in 1956, he recommends that if the missionaries actually want to work in Bahrain, they should hook up with uh, the, uh, the Church of England, should hook up with the local oil company, and then use that as a kind of a um, jumping off point to set up missions there. The relationship between the missions officers and the oil companies in those early years also extended to the former, to the, to the missionaries traveling on the tankers and staying in company guest houses. There's constant discussion of this. They were essentially given sort of a free ride on these tankers. I have to say I'm very jealous of this because I wish I could be doing that. Um, where the mission finally established the center after the withdrawal of formal British control in the peninsula ports, the trustees committees that managed the affairs of the missions were often the local grandees representing large corporations that were mostly British or British advisors in managerial roles there. So essentially in a lot of these places, there was this, this kind of, uh, in the, the board of trustees or the board of advisors were all these bigwigs, British bigwigs. So for example, the people listed as being interested in the work of the mission in Dubai in 1973 are almost entirely British. There's just a couple of exceptions of one Norwegian guy and one big Dubaian representative of a large shipping company. And these guys are all managers of shipping agencies, um, the P&O company, Dubai International Shipping Company, the British resident engineer, the harbor master, the port managers at Port Rashid, the chief of police and the advisor uh, to the ruler of Dubai. Even the representatives of the two Arab-owned shipping companies, Kanu of Bahrain and Kuwait Shipping Company, attending such meetings are British. So essentially, this is a kind of a completely British um, uh, concern. The extent to which these entanglements affected the work of the mission is murky. In a great many instances, the mission to seafarer chaplains attempt a reconciliation between the crew members and the ship's officers, and very often also the ship owning company. So instead of sort of trying to represent them, they try to bring them together, liaise between them, make peace between them. The reports are discreet, but throughout the 1980s and 1990s, um, the, these reports carry stories where the mission acted to pacify militant or angry seafarers and return them to work. If in the British colonial period and the subsequent decades and years, the work of the mission lined up with the British corporations, this had begun to change by the late 1980s. Um, though not exactly adversarial, the relationships today are very much less cozy. The advisory boards of the local missions are not any lo no longer stacked with British company men. And the fact that the missions have been NGOized, and I'll talk about this a, more, a bit more la later, has transformed the grounds of the relationship of these missions and these local companies. With the changes in co incorporation of the mission as a limited company as an NGO in the early 2000s, and its shift in attention to a more global body of seafarers, the character of the mission has changed, and it is more reliant now on its relationship with ITF and other unions than it is with the corporation. So that's an interesting shift. And, and I will talk about this a little bit more in the next section, where I will actually talk about the relationship between mission and workers. So if the work of the mission to seafarers in the Arabian Peninsula was facilitated or thwarted by the colonial and corporate officers who were sometimes one and the same people, in what way did the nature of their work with the seafarers and their relationship with these mobile population of workers change over the course of the years since the end of the Second World War? This shift from paternalistic and salvific work where you want to save people to more NGO-like delivery of humanitarian aid is the arc of development clearly traversed by the mission to seafarers in the Arabian Peninsula. Both the archives and the current practices of the mission to seafarers highlight three specific aspects, aspects of ministering to seafarers, which I think are really important if we want to think about what actually, who will be actually serving uh, the workers in a period of abandonment and precarity that we are living in. So these three aspects are number one, the questions of um, uh, uh, the role of race and nationality in determining the work of the mission. 
Number two, the salvific impulse as opposed to secular ministry. And finally, the individuating effect of missionary work. So let's start with race and nation. One of the most striking changes in the work of the mission to seafarers is a distinct shift from serving British or European seafarers to working with a far more diverse and international group of shipboard workers. In the archive, there are one or two missionaries who explicitly carry the patronizing, sometimes even racist, attitudes towards the seafarers. For example, one of them would complain, the poverty of some of these parts of the world is appalling, and their ignorance is almost as bad. They act like children and have to be treated as such. So standard racist language. Another would, for example, report appalling working conditions for British seafarers, uh, including a, a ship that didn't have any air conditioning and worked in the summers in the Gulf where the temperatures are above 50 degrees. Um, and then he, after discussing this um, kind of a terrible uh, shipping conditions, terrible working conditions, this a missionary added, perhaps Asian seafarers were better suited for these terrible jobs. He literally says that in, in, in the report that he writes. No questioning at all about sort of what this might mean. Now, this particular mission officer was so shocking that in one instance, Sierra Leonean seafarers he had patronized and mistreated refused to shake his, sand, his hand and quote, but set me up to the white boss as they thought I was his man. At least this guy was honest enough to report this in his reports, which makes for very interesting reading when you're going through the archives. Well, this particular officer most obviously reflected racist attitudes of British colonial officers um, abroad. Many others saw in the international seafarers they served an image of God. One long serving mission officer in Bahrain, who I became quite familiar with his handwriting because he had a very distinct handwriting and he wrote all of his reports by hand. And he was a really interesting character. And, and I've tried to find him online, but he doesn't, hasn't left a footprint. Um, but he uh, was a really quite a fascinating guy. And um, he writes um, in, in a very long reflection on his Christian service to seafarers. He ends it with a question Why do I serve ships of every nationality? Because God is not an Englishman, he is for everybody, which is a very distinct difference in attitude between him and the guy that I spoke before. So, so there were these different kinds of attitudes and the racist dudes were uh, in, in few, far fewer in number, actually, surprisingly, than, than, the, than the more um, kind of generous open ones. The second area, which is really important, is, of course, the idea of salvation and mor moralism. I began this talk with the story of Reverend Arnold, who tried to secure some dignity in death for a seafarer who had been killed aboard the ship. As I mentioned above, the story is striking because of the extent to which other institutions, organizations, and actors refuse this task. But the story is also striking because it is faith, uh, faith in God, or the strength of the Holy Spirit, as he says it, that allows Reverend Arnold to give the deceased captain a ritual cremation. Perhaps the intensity of the day-to-day -day work of dealing with abandoned seafarers or those injured at war does not leave much room for religious reflections, but the invocation of the Holy Spirit, or indeed any such religious homage, is quite rare in the documents. That was really surprising to me. This was a mission, but God doesn't appear very often in the writings. The vast majority of the reports focus on the practical problems resolved, bureaucratic issues addressed, and even pastoral and sacramental duties are dutifully enumerated and tabulated, but without, without much passion or without much sort of spiritual attachment. It's, it's very kind of pro, you know, pro forma. Institutionally, by the 1990s, the terminology around their work had also changed. From the 1990s onwards, the template for the monthly reports changes to include headings for the different report sections. And these are pastoral, i.e. dealing with sort of the mental health often of the seafarers, sacramental, so performing, giving them Bibles or performing uh, uh, religious rites on board ships, seafarers' rights, and general. So actually, sacramental ends up being just 25% of the report area and a, and a significantly smaller part of their work. The salvific and sacramental work of the mission to seafarers seems to be the most prominent in moments of encounter with communist seafarers in the 1980s, and especially after the 1991 dissolution of the Soviet Union. So essentially, they're much more interested in giving Bibles in Russian and Ukrainian to the Russian and Ukrainian seafarers than they are in almost any other category of worker. So their conversion is mostly with the Eastern Church um, adherence, which is quite interesting. <laughs> 
Um, okay, finally, and this is the bit I think that is perhaps most relevant in thinking about the future, is the area where the work of the missions officers is most needed, but it's also troubled by the fundamental and inherent character of missionary or welfare work and attending to those instances of abandonment or hyper-exploitation aboard ships. The process of NGOization of the mission to seafarers between the 1990s and the early 2000s has seen a significant shift from dependence on corporations to a closer working relationship with the International Transport Workers Federation, a global union that serves seafarers. Many of the reports from the 1990s onwards are filled with uh, expressions of actually support for the workers, um, and they're filled with enraged and frustrated accounts of injustice against the seafarers, and often a very good diagnosis of the exploitation of seafarers by the shipping companies, and with the acquiescence of the governments, which, quote unquote, hide behind the protocol of the ship's flag to avoid taking action to support their nationals. So they're very aware of what's going on. Their diagnosis is spot on. The more recent work of the missions to highlight the plight of abandoned seafarers, to advocate for them not only locally, but vocally and on the pages of international newspapers, similarly echo what a global union might have done to alleviate the situation of the seafarers in uh, the UAE. Um, I'm not sure if anybody here is a regular Guardian, uh, the British newspaper reader, but the Guardian has had a series of articles about abandoned seafarers again and again and again and again. And what is really interesting is that those articles have been placed there by the current mission to seafarers officer in Dubai, who's a very active person in these things. And he's, I had an interview with him and he's just a good old Christian socialist. Um, and so he, you know, he was quite happy to, 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 to sort of do this kind of advocacy because of course unions are banned in the UAE. And so he's, he's got, he uses these connections to actually do this kind of advocacy, which I found really, really interesting. But in an earlier period, the missionaries or the local chaplains that were seconded to the mission seem to have had more sympathy for the seafarers only if they displayed meekness and deference, if they were not militant. So a number of reports recount the mission officer facilitating reconciliation between seafarers and abusive officers. Um, uh, for example, officers that would get drunk and actually beat up the seafarers and the missionaries, the older missionaries were tried to reconcile this. A number of reports um, um, also, for example, uh, uh, show the resolution of labor disputes where the mission officer counsels the workers to bend a little and which in the end benefits the shipping company more than the seafarers. In these cases, the excuses, but these seafarers knew what they were signing on to, so they should just put up with it. And in some reports, disputes and worker strikes are blamed on one or two hardliners who are winding up the others. You know, the standard kind of excuses when their workers are demanding, there's, it's always one or two troublemakers who are doing this, not everybody else. What often distinguishes humanitarianism from autonomous and collective claim making by agential actors is the agential act is the fact that humanitarians often insist on the abject objects of humanitarianism. They often want somebody meek to, to, to be able to sort of uh, uh, receive gratefully their ministrations. Such humanitarianism, whether cast as salvific or not, focuses on resolving the problems of individual seafarers, a kind of therapeutic individualism. Such neoliberal notions of workplace justice can also see, be seen in a seafarers happiness index, which is produced by the mission. The index, which is produced four times a year, is supported by shipping and insurance companies, which they love because this actually allows for them to keep up worker productivity, because if workers are happy, they're more productive, right? So this happiness indices are very useful as that kind of... Um, as a kind of a tool of governmentality. Um, and so happiness, as in other contexts where it's intended to bolster economic productivity, has become a technology of governmentality here. And the mission is quite happy to produce it. They have their justifications. They're not talking about productivity, but it ends up having that effect. So in conclusion, like most people writing about the mission to seafarers, I will also declare that it is difficult to make a single story here. What is clear is that the mission serving seafarers are unique in many ways. On the one hand, there are one salvific organizations whose positionality vis-a-vis -vis workers and management often generates unresolved tensions. 
In this, they resemble land-bound industrial missions whose notions of service and welfare arose not out of radically egalitarian impulses, but out of pious attachments to gospel and its preaching about the abject and the itinerant. The question that arises is what role such institutions can play in a world in which workers are ever more precarious, ever more hyper-exploited but mobile. Will religious humanitarian uh, service bring with it soccer, you know, the, this is um, the opiate of the masses, which was meant as actually as a gentle sort of, uh, as, a, as, a, as a kind of a way of helping those that have been um, hurt, but at the cost of pacification? Or will it be able to be adapted to new modalities of mobilization, especially in places where unions are no longer in operation? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lale. It was a fascinating uh, talk and many points uh, resonate also uh, in other places, uh, including uh, the uh, Mediterranean. Let me know that uh, I didn't know uh, about Laurent Berlin's death. <laughs> and I want to join you in mourning her. <laughs> She was a brilliant uh, scholar and engaged activist, uh, the author of uh, wonderful uh, books uh, like The Cruel uh, Optimism. You will miss her. Yeah. So on this note, uh, I don't know uh, whether Charles or Lorenzo want to start. I'll um, thank you, um, Sandro and uh, um, I'll, I'll start uh, in responding uh, for Lorenzo and, and myself. Um, we're, we're also absolutely delighted um, to be here, even though we're, I am also uh, learning about the, the, the death of Lauren Berlant, um, who I never had a chance to, to meet, but whose work, of course, has been um, incredibly important, amongst others, via the, the article that you were uh, quoting, um, Lale. Um, but despite this, we really are delighted to be with you this evening with the Academy and being in dialogue with uh, you, Lale. Um, our, our, our dialogue actually goes, uh, you know, dates back to several years now. And in fact, we, we began engaging with your work um, just at the moment, I think you were beginning to embark um, on this uh, oceanic uh, exploration. Uh, I actually encountered your work um, rather through some of your previous analysis of kind of post-colonial genealogies of violence, uh, amongst others, through your, your work, Time in the, the Shadows. Um, I want to, to start by um, responding to, to your uh, paper today um, and consider the way it, it resonates with our own work. Um, through your emphasis on, on infrastructure, via uh, Berlin in your opening uh, statement, right? The centrality of uh, infrastructure to uh, politics uh, today. And this has clearly been at the center of um, your work over the last years, in particular um, in your book, Sinews of War um, and, and Trade, right? Where you really focused on maritime infrastructures and their uh, confluence as you uh, describe it um, with military, naval logics, capital, and, um, and labor. And it's fascinating to see you exploring another uh, strand here uh, of, of maritime politics through the highly ambivalent um, position of um, missions to seafarers. And it's, it's quite remarkable to follow you tracing that shifting positionality um, over time and the, su the su successive modalities of, of empire. Right? Infrastructure, of course, plays a fundamental role um, at, in, in, the in struggles over migration and borders at the maritime frontier, which have been um, the focus of our work was in the Forensic Oceanography Project over um, the last 10 years. We can see infrastructure play um, 
really a central role in, in different uh, ways. Diverse forms of circulations of goods, of information, of things, of people, um, are a source of power and thus of struggle over power, of conflict. Um, and these conflicts, of course, erupt into different moments and forms of, of violence. The art of capitalist logistics involves infrastructures, procedures, technologies that have been designed to enable the smooth flow of some always racialized class gendered people and goods across global transportation systems. Now these very mobility infrastructures um, are however denied to most populations of the global south as a result of the restrictive migration policies implemented by states of the global north. And these policies are partly mediated by transport companies, right, as a result of carrier sanctions, amongst others, whether it's uh, for passengers seeking to em embark on board um, aircrafts and flights or um, ferries and other, um, other seafaring vessels. And in this way, the very mobility infrastructures uh, that serve global uh, trade and circulation of goods across, across the networked global factories, this very infrastructure is also at the heart of a kind of anti-logistics, the projection of discontinuities for specific categories of people who are barred from accessing um, transport infrastructures. And this anti-logistic is in fact um, central to the form of violence that operates not only at sea, but through the sea. Restrictive migration policies force migrants to embark on um, precarious vessels and turn the sea into um, a deadly liquid for, for migrants. And in, it's in that sense that we've spoken since several years of a form of liquid violence, right? that again, operates not only at sea, but through the sea by turning the sea into um, a deadly liquid. Now, this anti-logistics does not only generate violence, but also generates a form of alter logistics. Illegalized migrants as a result of being denied access to safe and formal um, transport infrastructures are forced to forge alternative transport infrastructures that are inextricably made of actual vessels um, and of shared knowledge, of circulation, as well as um, professional smuggler networks. Um, this is what um, we, some have called the mobile commons, right? So maritime transport infrastructures are at the very center of struggle over migration and borders at the maritime frontiers of Europe and of course uh, beyond. And here too, we see that a range of activist initiatives over the last years have um, also had a key infrastructural and logistical dimension, if you will. I'm thinking, for example, of uh, the Watch the Med alarm phone network, which we've contributed to uh, found several years ago, which involves um, an activist hotline, right? The creation of a communication infrastructure, communicating, co connecting activists on all shores of the Mediterranean to migrants as they um, cross the sea and extending their voices um, so, so that uh, their, their voices can be heard and not only heard, but taken into account. And um, so that states may be pressured into complying with their obligation to rescue migrants in distress uh, at sea. Of course, there have also been several um, civilian rescue initiatives such as um, Mediterranea, which have deployed their own boats to make up for the lethal practices of abandonment performed by states and contest the outsourcing of border control in the aim of containing um, migrants beyond the Mediterranean's uh, shore. Now, at best, um, 
these initiatives have a clear understanding of the way they connect to and extend migrants' networks and struggles. That is, uh, the Alarm Phone, for example, or Mediterranean, consider um, my, that migrant struggles come first and understand their action as supporting or serving these struggles, while other initiatives, which are framed in more humanitarian terms, tend to rather foreground the, cel the central role of the rescuer in saving migrants, framed instead as uh, passive victims. So over the last 10 years, migrant struggles uh, in crossing the sea have been joined by a range of non-governmental actors which have contributed to transform the Mediterranean Sea into a transnational uh, political space, literally a sea um, of struggle. But migrant struggle, of course, um, against borders don't stop at the sea, um, and thus neither can the practices of those who support them. A major in, uh, issue in particular has been um, the question of disembarkation, in particular since the institution of Matteo Salvini as interior minister of Italy in 2018. But after disembarkation, um, migrants continue to encounter forms of violent bordering and abandonment that operate on firm land as well. And as a result, several initiatives, such as the Alarm Phone again and Mediterranean, have sought to better connect activism across land and um, sea. We see then across the sea um, what uh, Deborah Cohen has also reminded us, that infrastructures are not only a vehicle of domination, but also a means of transformation. And so this might lead me to um, a first question that I want to uh, share in connection to, to your wor work. What does looking at labor and political struggle through an amphibious um, gaze, which you, um, you know, describe as well in your book in relation to Michael Pearson's uh, work, what does this amphibious gaze um, uh, allow us to see in looking at labor and political struggles? What sh should this amphibious gaze be attuned to? And what is the role of infrastructures um, in these, uh, these struggles? Thank you very much. Should I, um, Sandro, should I, should I respond sure, or should sure, I wait sure. for Lorenzo to speak and then respond? Go on. I mean, let, let's uh, make it more like a dialogue. Okay, so th these are excellent questions and actually listening to the ways in which you talk about, you know, these um, civilian organizations that are involved in that work, it makes me think of the humanitarian impulse in this and there is actually a similarity in um, both of these populations uh, as objects of humanitarian attention. So there is, um, there are two, the, 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 the first question that you ask is, what does looking at a labor through an am amphibious gaze give us? And I think this is a question that has come up a lot in in, in, um, in talks that I have given around issues of seafarers, I'm writing a couple of papers and I'm constantly engaging with this. And what becomes clear is that in some ways, these muscles of empire, these seafarers, um, have, in, in, have actually embodied new modalities of work, new modalities of governmentality, new modalities of exploitation um, at every stage that they have existed, that their, their, their working conditions have foretold transformations in the ways in which other forms of work um, have uh, developed. Uh, thereafter. So it's one of, you know, work, work aboard ships is one of the first places where automation is introduced, for example, mm -hmm. with tankers. And so in looking at these um, seafarers or looking at question of labor through an amphibious gaze, I think one can see those development of precarity, one can see the development of uh, modalities of control and discipline, one can see modalities of pacification um, uh, and transformation of these agential subjects into um, 
human objects of abject objects of humanitarianism much more clearly and i think that uh, a question that i was asked uh, a couple of days ago in, a, on, in in another talk that i was giving on embodied work of seafarers was do you see them as being a forebears of anybody else and i was like actually i was thinking and i was going you know what the way that seafarers today work in some of these big shipping uh, you know big container ships actually is like everybody else along the chain in logistics work precarious they may not be gig workers, mm -hmm. but they don't have permanent employment. They go from contract to contract. Um, they're completely and totally precarious. And they don't have control, in essence, over uh, what, what they can do. They're uh, the, the sort of the punctuated staccato form of employment that they have uh, takes away a lot of their agency. The fact that they cannot, for example, organize because they are not in a stable working situation with a bunch of people. The fact that the, the, the conditions, the, the material conditions of their work does not allow for organization is a pacifying factor. And I think that that amphibious case allows us to see how this happened in the context of uh, and then, of course, you know, all the stuff with the uh, offshoring, with the deregulation of labor, we see all, you know, all of this kind of presages uh, the precarious forms of work that we see today happening on land bound work. Um, but also th there's a wonderful phrase that um, Vivek Bald, who is a historian of uh, Asian communities, migration in Harlem, has in his book, is he talks about seafarers as being hyper exploited, but extremely mobile. And I think that hyper exploitation and extreme mobility is one that characterizes the subjects of your, the interlocutors of your studies, but also the interlocutors mm -hmm. of this particular study that I'm working on. And I think that that to me is uh, quite interesting. The second question that you asked about infrastructures is I think that in some ways we have to think about infrastructures as being not only the, the sort of the material, the ports and the ships. Um, in, in, your, in, in the Mediterranean rescue cases, the ships that transport, but we also have to think about the things that are much uh, less concrete. So the legal infrastructures, the political ones, and Matteo, Matteo Salvini, for example, being in power, is part of the infrastructure of repression and control. And we also have the legal infrastructures and political infrastructures, which also delimit the possibility of worker mobilization. And I and I'm of two minds. So I've given this talk now several times. And at the end of each talk, I wonder whether the missions are part of a pacification infrastructure or are they part of a potential opening where the unions are unable to enter? Can they be part of an opening for a new form of mobilization, identification and, uh, and, and uh, collectivity? And I think I'm, I'm undecided on that. So they are also part of that infrastructure in that way. Mm -hmm. Humanitarianism is part of the infrastructure of capitalism because it takes the edges off of these things. So I think that's how I also see infrastructure being quite useful in thinking about your subject and my subject, which are you know, both intersect at the sea. Thank you, Lale. And if I may, maybe this is a good point for me to jump into the discussion. And uh, I mean, you just recall the idea of like hyper exploitation being linked to extreme mobility, right? Which reminds me, and which I think you say very aptly kind of describe also the, you know, the condition of migrants today. And it reminds me also of like the work of, of another participant in the, in the academy, Martina Tazzioli, who was writing about how you know, um, keeping migrants in motion is also a form of control, right? So mobility, you know, we, we often think about control as something that confines people to particular spaces. You have families that are also written about carceral seas, et cetera. But there is a, you know, the other side of the coin is also like hypermobility as a form of, of, of control, right? And exploitation as well, right? Of keeping people exploitable, at least, let's see. Um, but so let me maybe jump into my question uh, which I think, you know, kind of follows similar lines, but perhaps arrives at a similar question about, you know, activism and politics at sea from a slightly different perspective, like keeping an infrastructural gaze, but maybe more understanding infrastructure in, in, in Keller Easterling's terms of like, you know, infrastructure as a certain special disposition that, you know, allows or not allows certain things, right? So I'm really interested here, I guess, also, in the question of, let's say, the legal geographies of the sea and how it connects to land, right, as a, as a kind of point of, of intersection. First, before I do that, let me, you know, allow me just to thank uh, 
briefly, you know, Sandra and the organizers of this event, especially for giving me the opportunity to, you know, it's a great honor and privilege to respond to, to your work, Lale. So thanks, Sandro, and, and everyone else for that. Um, I think what really struck me um, in your insightful discussion of the role of these missions is the rather ambiguous and unorthodox role that they have played in relation to imperial powers, right? Both in terms of like, you know, imperial government officials, right? The envoys, political agents, etc., but also in terms of its corporate, you know, the corporate face of, of empire, right? Um, and it's a role that you describe, you know, um, very well, I think, as existing in a precarious balance between being instrument of domination and defiance, right, as, as per the Komarov uh, uh, quote, right, and, and, you know, between fomenting and, and instead pacifying dissent, right. So this description really stuck with me because it resonates, I think, very much with the ways in which uh, we, as well as uh, many others in the context of cross-Mediterranean migration, have described a role of a wide range of actors who formally, you know, perhaps they don't have anything to do or very little to do with migration and border rings proper um, in the same way that, you know, perhaps missions had formally you know, not much to do at least with shipping or with labor or with capital accumulation, et cetera. And yet they still play a key role in the government of migration and in the struggle against borders, right? So in a sense, in our world, we are, work, we have tried to, pay particular attention to what Eng and Ho called the other boats, right? So, you know, not the boats of empire, you know, the men of war of, you know, the big kind of, you know, ship that, that carries, you know, the, the, the envoy, et cetera, but, but really these other boats that sit in some kind of tension with that boats of empire. And I think there are two main actors that I wanted to, you know, bring to the foreground here. One is obviously merchant vessels, right, which have also played a very important role in the struggle around borders and migration in the Mediterranean. And in the central Mediterranean, it's, you know, quite complex and serious. But the moment that we, as in, you know, Charles and I encountered first um, and, and directly, let's say, in the frame of our research was in late 2014. And the medium through which we encountered that was through uh, uh, you know, AIS tracks, right? So the automatic identification vessel system tracking, right? That, you know, we were looking at in order to try to understand, you know, what was happening in relation to migration and borders. And we started to notice that, you know, while normally the, the, um, the tracks of merchant vessels are very straight and, you know, follow the very established kind of, you know, maritime routes, at some point in late 2014, they started to morph into kind of more frantic, let's say, zigzag tangles, right? Which we later discovered, you know, where the visual representation of search and rescue operations that were tasked to carry out, you know, in the central Mediterranean. So what happened, you know, in a nutshell in those months was that the retreat of state-sponsored rescue assets in the central Mediterranean left you know, a rescue gap that then the Italian Coast Guard was kind of, oh, I see, you don't see it anymore. It's kind of, I don't know if it's the slightly religious <coughs> topic of this conversation that makes this huge light. Sorry about that. Um, I was saying the, the um, I was talking about the, the role of the merchant vessels and you know how after the retreat of, of, of state-sponsored rescue operations, they were called upon to carry out rescue operations in a very you know extreme way, in the sense that at some point in, in the beginning of 2014, they came to perform about 30% of all search and rescue operations compared to I think 20, something like 27 by you know, the, the agency that was officially entrusted in doing that, which was the Italian Coast Guard, right? So all of a sudden, you know, you had these merchant vessels becoming the, 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 the most prominent, you know, uh, search and rescue operator in the central Mediterranean. So we describe this process as a privatization of rescue, or rather we called it uh, also in another article as a temporary nationalization of commercial shipping to operate search and rescue, right? Indicating that, you know, privatization should not be understood simply as the withdrawal of the state, but rather it sees repositioning, right? As, as Saskia Sassen famously argued. So um, 
why I think this involvement is particularly interesting is that it led, uh, you know, um, an industry association, the European Shipowner Association, to send out pretty vocal press releases in which they were advocating for, and I quote, provide refugees and migrants with alternative means of finding safety without risking their lives by crossing the Mediterranean in unseaworthy boats, right? So with the language that was not too dissimilar from that, that you know, many activists and human rights organizations were using in those very same you know, days, right? Um, at the same time, you know, we also noted later in, in our work how you know, uh, uh, merchant vessels became the, the prime operators of what we call privatized pushbacks as well. So they also became involved in, in human rights violations that you know, still are taking place also you know, in these very last days by a lot of like the, the ships that transit across the central Mediterranean or the, the offshore uh, uh, vessels that supply, you know, the platforms that are off the coast of Libya and that often become embroiled in this, in this, you know, cases of, of privatized rescue. So merchant vessels is one, I think, of the actors that embodies and exemplifies this kind of, you know, ambiguous relation, you know, uh, uh, with, with migration and, and borders. And the other one, of course, is the one that you know Charles was already recalling, that of rescue NGOs, right? That you know precisely took the sea in 2015 in response to a shocking number of shipwrecks that led you know to to to, to many deaths, uh, you know that took place at the very moment of rescue when you know merchant vessels were tasked to rescue you know migrants in distress and not being equipped to do those very difficult search and rescue operations. You know this encounter between these huge, you know, cargo ships and these like tiny, you know, migrants boat led to a to a number of, of very dramatic uh, uh, death and, and shipwrecks, right? So here, I think I was particularly interested in your presentation by how you describe the mission's relation to empire, not as a static one, right, but rather as one that was constantly shifting, right? So how this mission started. Uh, uh, you know, in the last few decades to play a more oppositional and somewhat counter-hegemonic role, uh, uh, and precisely through the language of NGOs and humanitarianism, right, as, as you noted. Uh, um, and so I think, you know, this was particularly useful for me to think about also the fraud relation that, you know, a lot of these search and rescue NGOs also maintain with humanitarianisms and with kind of border controllers, right? Uh, um, and, and in thinking and reflecting about this, this tension, right? Because I do think that, you know, the shift that you were pointing at also echoes in some way how the meaning of humanitarian intervention in the Mediterranean has changed with the arrival of the search and rescue NGOs, right? So, you know, humanitarianism traditionally understood as, you know, the left end of the empire, uh, you know, as an anti-politics machine and so on, now becomes really a kind of oppositional force, right? Through, you know, as Charles was recalling, the work of, of Mediterranean and, and, and many others of the NGOs that have taken the sea, right? And so I'm interested in thinking about, you know, this act of repolitization in a sense of search and rescue that this organization has performed, not simply as an act of compassion, but as an act of struggle for freedom of movement and as part of this infrastructure of solidarity that Charles was already recalled, a chain in that underground railroad supporting the mobility of those who Gassanage has called the maroons of the enslaving order of national borders, right? And I wonder, and here I, I conclude, if there is maybe something specific to the legal and political geographies of the sea or rather of this intersection between land and sea that make a certain kind of oppositional intervention possible, right? And in some of my earlier writing on the prehistory of search and rescue in the Mediterranean, I was looking at the, at the Indo, uh, Indo-Chinese boat people crisis, right? In, in the South China Sea in the late seventies. And there it's very clear how, you know, the ocean, you know, the, you might say the international space par excellence provided, you know, uh, the ideal space for a new wave of humanitarians without borders, right? Those were the, you know, the years where, where Medicine Sans Frontier was being founded, you know, when like the so-called second, you know, wave of, of humanitarianism was really taking uh, pace, right? And so 
you know, the idea that the high sea is being placed outside the full jurisdictions of any sovereign space, provided these actors as the effective form of extraterritorial, extraterri sorry, extraterritoriality in which independent intervention was possible, you know, was really resonating with some of the things that you have also been writing about, you know, shipping, etc. right? Needless to say, you know, these also always encounter some sort of friction, right? Because then these ships on the one end, you know, were flying flags of European states in, in, in the case of, of, you know, Indochina, but also, you know, once they were bringing back the people on shore, the moment of disembarkation has always become this moment of tension, right? So I kind of, I guess, yeah, I'm just like, bringing these examples as a way to, you know, prompt you perhaps to think further about, you know, this idea of like what kind of political activism or militancy does the sea allows for, right? And especially at this intersection between land and sea, right? And how can we rethink this connection, you know, as a way to, to think about different kind of struggle for liberation from labor oriented one to, you know, borders and migration related one. This is a really brilliant question, and I um, and it is it's not one that I have a direct answer to. In part because, on the one hand, I want to say, okay, so the sea is in some ways a liminal space. It's not one. It's a it's, it's a space of excess, right? Uh, the, the, it, you you could d define borders around it. You can have economic zones and whatever, but all of those are constantly contested. Sometimes contested by the less powerful states, sometimes by the more powerful ones. So when, for example, the U.S. decides to, or when actually most recent example when the British decide to go into Russian waters, um, you know, that, and they do so knowing that they're going to provoke the Russians. There is something going on about the contestation of the space of the sea as being kind of outside of the jurisdiction of specific nation states. And I think that that would, in part, obviously would allow that kind of a borderless forms of activism that you're mentioning, which goes from MSF, but also to Mediterranean, uh, etc. But at the same time, uh, you know, that, that space that is a, a space of excess, that is a space of not full control, is also one that is constantly surveilled. I mean, the very fact that you mentioned that we have a record of AIS, of sh ships passing by. So both temporally and spatially, we have a record of these uh, ships that are occupying this space. Um, uh, it also tells me that it is not entirely dissimilar from the space of land because that is also completely surveilled and controlled and, 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 and the very fact of flying a particular kind of flag, the very fact that some, that the fact that the US Coast Guard has ships in, you know, the coast of China because the US Coast Guard can do so. And therefore it, it has forms of nationalizing that space, forms of controlling that space that is not available to others. Also tells me that on the one hand you have this liminality and borderlessness. And on the other hand, you have this extreme power asymmetry, which you know big naval powers with their big warships have far more control of the seas and their satellites and their AIS and their GPS and their radar and their all the different ways in which they can control it than, than one could imagine in, in, a, in a more egalitarian access to the sea. So in, in that way, this, this extreme of ambivalence perhaps, or the, this extreme of contradictoriness or dialectic of the, the use of the sea as, as on the one hand open and as on the other hand completely foreclosed, is perhaps the intensity of that is much more than the land. But I still think that um, as much as I would like to think of the sea as kind of borderless, and as much as one, one is on the ship and you're going through the Mediterranean and you don't see anything for you know, days, it gives you a sense that you're in a space that is not like the shore, it's not like the land, it's not completely controlled. Nevertheless, I know that there is an eye in the sky looking at me, and you guys probably know that better than anybody, given the forensic ocean, you know, forensic oceanography work that you do. And so that also ends up being a question I, I, I'm not giving you an answer because I think I'm completely and totally undecided on that. I, I am not. I, on the one hand, think that the sea can provide these forms of um, 
allows for these forms of borderless activism. But I also think that those forms of borderless activism are far more precarious at sea, precisely because you can drown, precisely because if you're stowaway, you can be chucked off the ship, precisely because your ship can be hit by, you know, Coast Guard or Navy ships or merchant vessels or whatever, you know. So in a, in a way, again, I'm off two minds. Sorry, that's that's a terrible kind of an, uh, response, but I I really... I haven't made up my mind in 100%. I think there, there's a scope to think of it in both ways. Thank you, Lale. Uh, it is time for uh, questions, comments uh, from uh, people following on Zoom, uh, from the audience. Uh, I think it is better to start uh, with people uh, on Zoom. Any questions? from the audience. Well, I would like to ask a lot of questions uh, and uh, to uh, make up a dialogue with uh, Lale, with Lorenzo, with uh, Charles. I think the question of uh, infrastructures has, uh, has been uh, raised and framed uh, tonight is a really uh, crucial question. It's a crucial question at sea in different uh, settings, as uh, we heard, but uh, it is more and more uh, uh, central uh, uh, also to social movements uh, uh, land, social movements uh, uh, acting uh, on different uh, issues. politicization of uh, infrastructures uh, is, of course, uh, uh, an important task, uh, although a very difficult one. And, uh, I completely understand uh, uh, Lale when uh, she says uh, that uh, she remains undecided uh, regarding the uh, status of uh, missions to uh, seafarers. Maybe uh, it could be uh, good uh, to say a uh, couple of words more, uh, Lale, on uh, the issue of uh, seafarers' abandonment. Because uh, I think people that are not uh, familiar with the world of shipping uh, uh, may not understand what uh, you are talking about. Indeed, uh, uh, seafarers' abandonment uh, uh, is something that happens uh, quite often and that was uh, intensified, uh, multiplied uh, during uh, uh, the pandemic for uh, reasons uh, that uh, it is not difficult uh, to understand. But what does uh, seafarers' abandonment mean? Uh, yeah, answer. I'll be very happy to talk about that because actually, again, the larger paper, the, the 20,000 okay. words. I think it is very important, you know, uh, yeah. after, after abandonment, uh, uh, maritime workers are in a kind of gray zone. You know, yeah. Because people can think, okay, they have been fired, but often uh, uh, they uh, have to remain uh, in the ship. And so uh, they are in a, in a situation in which it is very difficult for unions uh, to do yeah. something. Uh, and it is in such situations uh, that uh, uh, missions uh, uh, can be, uh, let's say, used by maritime workers uh, and uh, therefore uh, politicized. Yeah. 
I think that you're absolutely right. So abandonment, and I think that that was central to my argument, is that um, there is no one else in some of these instances of abandonment doing the work of the missions, because there is nobody else that can do the work of the, the missions. The missions are present in a lot of places. They have been accepted as being kind of apolitical um, organizations, which gives them a certain degree of um, a, a sort of uh, ability to operate in places where a political organization, for example, like a union, would not be um, accepted. So what is abandonment? Um, it's uh, the International Labour Organization has actually started uh, some years ago to um, to track um, the uh, ships that to track the uh, ships that have been either arrested or abandoned. Um, and if they have been arrested and the owner of the ship is unwilling to pay the fines uh, and, and the ship is just left to be, then essentially the seafarers on there are abandoned. So abandoned sea ships are those where for one reason or another, the, sea, the, the ship owner sort of stops, refuses to pay wages, goes bankrupt, uh, etc. And so allows for those ships to actually then stay in a bunch of ports somewhere um, with all of the seafarers on board, no wages paid, and then they're running out of money, they're running out of fuel, they're running out of food. Um, and one of the reasons that I chose uh, specifically Dubai um, to, to actually do some of the study in um, is because Dubai is the number one destination for abandonment of ships in the ILO, based on the ILO database. Uh, by far, it has the highest number of abandoned ships on its coast. And the reasons for that are several. Number one, it's a country that is not signatory to the various international treaties that deal with questions of abandonment. Number two, it is a country which doesn't give a shit about workers. Unions are banned. Um, number three, it is a um, port of Jabal Ali in Dubai is one of the largest ports in the world. Therefore, there are a lot of ships that are going through and delivering things. And then once the ship owners have collected the money for the cargo they have delivered, they stop paying wages and they abandon the seafarers and they abandon them somewhere along the coast. Um, and so all of these factors go into, um, into this process. But there's also a broader structural factor that makes the UAE a location for abandonment of ships. And that is that this is a, this is a country that has for years exploited migrant laborers. And so the question of migrant laborers actually can be exploited in a particular set of ways. And so they don't care about these seafarers that are aboard the ships. This is just another instance of migrant labor essentially being on their coast that are being um, you know, they're being mistreated. And so in, in these instances, the mission to seafarers is absolutely crucial. So as I said, the reports, for example, are full of uh, cases where the mission to seafarers is providing food, um, negotiating with various bodies, trying to sort of get support for the seafarers. And, and, and as I mentioned, in the case of the, the guy in Dubai, the socialist Christian guy in Dubai, he's actually publicizing these cases in ways that allows for, uh, you know, there was one instance of a ship being abandoned for four years. There were people on board the ship, seafarers on board the ship for four years not being paid on the coast of Dubai. They could, or on the coast of Ras Al Khaime, a, a little um, emirate a little bit further north. They could not get off the ship. When they tried to actually swim to the shore, the uh, Emirati Coast Guard actually said that they'll shoot at them, so force them to go back on board the ship. And it was in an instance such as that that the Mission to Seafarer guy actually publicized this in The Guardian, and within weeks that situation was resolved in a way that you don't see that elsewhere. And so the, the, this is really quite important. Now, what, the, what COVID has done, has uh, it has resulted in... Uh, incredibly high, large spike in the number of abandonments at sea, but it has also introduced a new form of abandonment. So as you recall, during the periods of um, the lockdown, a lot of uh, seafarers, uh, you know, airports were closed, but also a lot of people were not allowed through the borders. And like many other instances, quarantines are used as a bordering practice. They always have been, they've always been quarantines and sort of dealing with disease has always been a form of introduction of new forms of government control. And so one of the, one of the uh, rules that was introduced by almost every country uh, was that uh, seafarers could not uh, get off the ship. They just simply could not get off the port. And even when they could get off the port, they couldn't fly home because their flights were not running, which meant that um, the maximum 
length of time that a seafarer is supposed to stay at sea is 11 months. That's the absolute maximum. There were instances of seafarers being at sea for 24 months. And in many instances, while they were being fed on the ships, they were not being paid. So they were actually, on, and that's a form of abandonment. They were on working ships. They weren't working, but they could not go anywhere. They were essentially imprisoned in these total institutions. And that's also, and the number of seafarers that were uh, abandoned in this form fluctuated between, at one stage, um, up to 500, uh, 400 to 500,000 workers that were seafarers that were abandoned in this form. They were beyond their 11 months of contract by several months. And so it's a kind of an outrageous thing when you think about it. Um, now, this form of abandonment actually, interestingly, had one of these things where the IMO and the International Chamber of Shipping and the ITF all came together and were like, let's, let's get them off. So they were actually working together to get the seafarers off. But in the case of seafarers that are abandoned at shores on rickety ships that are dust bu rust buckets and falling apart and being destroyed, then really the mission to seafarers is in many places the only institution that will uh, willingly help, that will um, be able to help these seafarers by doing something as simple as de delivering water uh, or uh, rice or uh, lentils so that people can eat. So it is an enormously significant factor and that um, you're absolutely right, Sandra. In order to understand why the work of the mission to seafarers is so necessary, it is un important to understand the scale of abandonment that happens in seafaring and maritime work. Thank you so much, Lale. Uh, we have time for a last question. If anybody um, is too shy to ask a question, you can also, I'm going to write my email uh, to actually, um, perhaps the academy can send it to absolutely to, to the attendees as well. But my email address is in the, uh, is, uh, is at uh, Queen Mary and you can find me and you can email me if you'd like. Okay, there is a question in the chat, which is that would uh, would like to ask you about the connections between the ambiguous transnational space of the sea discussed today and that of airspace. Do you see similarities between the working conditions of seafarers and um, airline attendants, uh, pilots, and others who work in transnational airspace? If yes, do you find the mobilization of flight attendants, such as through strikes in Taiwan and in the EU, hopeful towards the possibility of mobilization by seafarers as well? I think there are some differences, and I think that that's um, uh, in, in the case of uh, airlines, um, I, I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm trying to think, but there are very distinct differences and airlines have had enormous amounts of mobilization in ways, you know, they, they, uh, their unions can organize, they can, you know, down, um, uh, they, they can down airlines. But part of the reason that the same does not necessarily apply to seafarers is not because of the geography, the similarities in the ge or the differences in the geography between airspace and the sea, but rather because in the case of airline uh, flight attendants and pilots, they are often employed by the airlines, right? So they are in long-term employment and that gives them leverage, right? Whereas with seafarers, seafarers essentially go from contract to contract. There are very, they're, they're vanishingly minuscule number of seafarers that have employment by a shipping company. They just don't. So they go from contract to contract and their contracts are anywhere from four months to 11 months and they're recruiting agencies that hire them. And so that means in essence that they don't have the ability, they don't have the leverage, they're essentially casualized workers is what they are. Um, one of the interesting things is that in the period of time where seafarers were employed by shipping companies, seafarers were actually much more militant than dock workers were. Dock workers were casualized and they did not have the same ability, in, in, at least in Britain. I, I can't speak to the world. But dock workers in Britain struggled against casualization. And once they actually became employees of the docks, their degree of ability to mobilize has increased uh, incredibly. And to me, one of the things that is really interesting is that seafaring, as I mentioned earlier, no new forms of precarity were introduced at sea that have been transported to elsewhere. And these forms of casualized employment contracts is one of the most significant inventions of capital in order to pacify workers um, on, on the ship. There are so few strikes 
on ships nowadays. Even at the worst time during this abandonment, this COVID abandonment, seafarers constantly threatened to um, strike and none did. And so I think to me, that is actually quite bad news, really, if you think about it. Okay, so the ne and then there's a question in Q&A, um, which is, how can we address the problem of flags of convenience? Is there something public international law can do, perhaps through treaty? So that's a very good and interesting question, in part because I think that the um, flags of convenience have been pretty much accepted uh, as, as pro forma. Uh, I've given talks where people have objected, for example, to me using the term flags of convenience. And they've said, well, why don't you use just the term open registries? Because that's just what they are. And flags of convenience is a little bit pejorative. And I'm like, yes, but they are. But unfortunately, much like offshoring, um, you know, the, the offshore ownership of companies, offshore tax havens, um, uh, flags of convenience are also a form of offshoring. And they're being not only tolerated by the states, but they're actually used as a modality of disciplining. It's also important important to note that there are flags of convenience. And then a lot of the countries that have kind of quite strict national flags, Britain, Netherlands, Norway, they also have international registries, which are closer to flags of convenience in terms of the laxness of the rules that they have for labor and taxation and various other things. And, and I think it's, um, it's quite striking to see that, again, that becomes a source of income and it's tolerated. Um, there, in, in the OECD, the OECD has an international transport um, forum. Uh, and one of the researchers in the international transport forum also points to some of the other ways in which the shipping industry gets away with really horrendous kinds of bad behavior. Flags of convenience is one, but one of the other ways that they do is by paying incredibly low taxes. Olaf Merck um, has done a couple of studies in which he shows that um, the, the sort of the average tax rate that the shipping companies are paying to their national, to their nations is 7%. So think about that. These are, you know, they're, they're thinking about doing a minimum corporate tax rate and the minimum corporate tax rate being 20%. Uh, they're thinking about doing this in the G7. Shipping companies are paying 7% median. And so there's a, a lot of ways in which the corporations are embedded in the state, sometimes through sort of being the primary, the, the number one contributor to the GDP, as is the case with Maersk in Denmark, for example. And that allows them to get away with all sorts of things, including paying lower taxes, including flags of convenience, including moving their workers from sort of the, um, the national flags to international flags so that the terms of their employment um, diminishes and lots of other instances such as that. Thank you. We have uh, a last question from the audience. Please, David. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, your, your, your contribution. And my question is about the project of forensic uh, oceanography. And I saw some of uh, your wonderful uh, works and I really got impressed um, by uh, watching the, the works of you colleagues uh, of forensic uh, architecture in Goldsmith. So uh, you talk about the, the politics of infrastructure and citing uh, Keller Esterling uh, work as a statecraft and I remember very well um, a particular point uh, that is the, um, the point of the uh, disposition. Uh, I remember that Kel uh, Esterling said that uh, in infrastructure space uh, is like a river and disposition can be caught by watching its ripples. And I, I was wondering if the ripples may be uh, the temporary forms by which the distinction of the uh, friend and the enemy decodes me, citing Carl Schmitt, can be coded. Thank you. Thank you for uh, yeah for this beautiful question. Um, I don't know, Charles. Shall shall I start? You want to offer some thoughts? No. Um, I mean, I can start. Then, yeah, you should you should come in. I guess. Um, I mean, maybe one way to answer your question is also somehow a way to reconnect back to some of the things that you, Lale, were saying in in response to you know to my question. 
in, you know, how do we think about, you know, the space of the sea, right? Like, yeah, it is indeed a space of excess, but it's also like, yeah, a carceral space, right? Or can become a space of, of control, et cetera. And, and I think, yeah, it's, it's very important to keep that duality, you know, always in play, right? You know, the tension cannot be resolved, right? In a sense, I don't think, you know, yeah, we can never say, oh, we side with one vision or the other because it's, you know, everything somehow happens in the middle, right? And it seems to me that, you know, the, the, the passage from Keller that, that you were um, mentioning, uh, da uh, Davide, if I remember well, yes. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite good in, in allowing us to think precisely about this, this, you know, this kind of like dual nature, right? Because she speaks about this idea of, let's say, disposition, right? Of, let's say, a kind of, you know, how maritime, well, I mean, she doesn't speak only, you know, about maritime geographies, of course, but let's say in our reading, let's say, of her work, we use her work to think about, you know, how, uh, you know, the legal geographies of the sea are, you know, this kind of very complex and overlapping spaces that create, you know, these possibilities, right, for violence to occur, right? They, they create the conditions in which, you know, the death of migrants is not simply a kind of, a, 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 you know, a kind of a temporary or, or fortuitous kind of, you know, outcome, but it's really somehow a structural outcome of the violence of the, of the border regime, right? So in a sense, it seems to me, uh, uh, you know, like thinking about, you know, as you were saying, like this, 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 you know, the ripples and the liquidity of the space, it can be very productive uh, in this sense, right? And, and I remember, you know, at the beginning of our work on the Mediterranean, you know, one of the kind of initial work that spurred also our interest was a work by a collective of architects called Multiplicity, which was called Solid Sea, right? And in that work, they were describing the Mediterranean as this space that was increasingly kind of, you know, fixed, right? Where, where different roles and different positions and different lines of crossing were being kind of increasingly solidified, right? It wasn't anymore that space of communication and exchange as it had been, you know, uh, um, represented historically. And, and, you know, I think in the course of our work, well, of course, you know, that's, that kind of process of solidification is, is important and it's certainly there, but we increasingly came to see how actually perhaps the more interesting way to look at this question was not so much to look at how, you know, the stable geographies of the land had colonized somehow the sea, but rather the other way around, right? How, you know, this kind of liquidity and, and precarity of like some of the legal arrangements and political arrangements of the sea have in fact kind of permeated also, you know, and, and striated kind of, you know, international space, right? So I don't know if that really answers your question. It's basically, you know, kind of maybe a, a jumping off from that, but hopefully offer, offer some, some you, know, you know, ideas to, to continue thinking about those lines. Maybe if I can say just a few very, very brief um, words. What I, what I want to hold on to here uh, in the concept of disposition is a certain indeterminacy, right? Particular spaces, particular legal infrastructures, et cetera, they create a certain set of possibilities, right? But don't, they don't always need to materialize. So there's a certain sense of potentiality there. And I think that level of indeterminacy is really in fact at work um, with missions to seafarers, with um, rescue at sea, whether it's performed by merchant ships or by, um, by rescue NGOs in fact as well. And somehow, one thing that is really striking in the process of repoliticization of um, uh, non-governmental activism at sea, or the shift from privatized rescue to privatized pushback, is the way a time of an identical, or very, very similar practice comes to be embedded in uh, very different relations to the state and to migrants themselves, right? So an almost identical rescue practice can at times um, enter a relation of normalization or complicity, even with uh, state actors, 
or be criminalized. And, and the, the salience, if you will, of its, of its politics um, at times is not so much uh, dependent on, you know, the, the activity of an NGO or maybe of a, of a mission to seafarers, but um, the way it's embedded in shifting political uh, relations, whether on the level of states and capital, or the way it's being appropriated by migrants or seafarers, right? So I think we, we see that um, level of indeterminacy, both in different spaces and infrastructures, but also in um, the practices that we've been discussing uh, today. Thank you. Uh, we really have uh, to stop. It's getting late in Bologna and it's getting dark. <laughs> There is no light here. It's a very precarious uh, infrastructure. And so uh, I think uh, we really have uh, uh, to close uh, this uh, wonderful uh, event. <laughs> Many questions uh, remain open. I only regret uh, that uh, we cannot have uh, a beer and a dinner together. <laughs> but uh, there will be a follow-up. So thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo, Charles, and thank you very, very much, uh, Lale, for uh, a wonderful uh, presentation and for the generosity in uh, the discussion. See you soon um, thank again. You. Thank you so much, Sandra, and I can't wait to come and have some lovely tortelloni in, in, in <laughs> Bologna one day. It's better in the winter, you know. I <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Thank you thank very, you very much, much, Lorenzo and Charles, also. Thank for your you, Lali. Thank you, Lali. It was been and great, thanks, to, great to be in dialogue. And can I also thank the Michaela and Francesco, soon, as well absolutely. as Antonio, for all of the work they have done. Thank you absolutely. very much, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you.